process would be whether it would be verbal, physical, or emotional, or in some way spiritual. But we come into conflict sometimes with each other. And that conflict doesn't necessarily have to be bad, but it's not necessarily good unless we know how to deal with conflict. When I was growing up, there used to be a place called the Institute of Basic Youth Conflict Seminar. Yeah, people used to go to it every year, and I'm sure that maybe they still do. I'm not sure. But one of the things that we've been doing is that we've taken the handbook or the book of the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, and we've taken it as an expanded thought process for us to use as a foundation to go from what is stated there and expound upon it and expand it to include those things that God has inspired us with, knowing that works within the relationship boundaries that we have of human being to human being, of man with God, of God interjections with man. And the way that those conflicts are resolved is why we sit down to plan out, to cooperate together, as it were, to teach and to reach each other so that we can learn how not to be any more children tossed to and fro with every woman doctrine, but to use, as it were, the scriptures as our basis for knowing the way we should go when we do come into conflict with each other. What happens when a man disagrees with a woman? What happens when two women disagree and argue? What do you do when you're caught in a debate? Where do you find yourself when you resist authority and you say to them, no, I hate you, or you're angry with your brother needlessly, or you find yourself even in conflict with a nonbeliever and a believer? How do you resolve those things cooperatively without using the famous cliche, we agree to agree disagreeably, or we agree to agree, we agree to disagree, you know, agreeably? It's kind of a cliche that doesn't work because it's not a principle based upon the foundation of scripture. And we've learned as we've gone through it that we've gone through that we must take care of certain aspects in our own personal life before we can appreciate a relationship. We have to go through the process of evaluating our own personal relationship with God, whether we are dealing with certain areas of conflict in our own personal life. That's a one-on-one with God before we even get involved with another human being. The area of assurance of salvation, the area of our self-image, the area of our purpose in life, the area of harmony at home, the area of moral purity, the area of genuine friendships. And if you haven't really had a chance or an opportunity to look at those videos or those tapes on principles of life, I would suggest going back and looking at them. Because in that, our assurance of salvation, the scripture assures us that it is possible to know beyond all doubt that we do possess eternal life in 1 John 5.13. In our self-image, the scripture teaches us that we are intricately designed and that each of our basic physical characteristics was prescribed by God and developed according to His plan in Psalm 139.14.16. In our purpose in life, the scripture tells us and directs us not to be vague, but to firmly grasp what we know to be the will of God in Ephesians 5.15 and 17. In our harmony at home, the scripture attaches significant benefit and reward to the one who submits to the authority and direction of the parents as though are set over him by the Lord in Ephesians 6.1.2. And we learn how harmony at home also extends itself in the outer circle and sphere of influence that it's not just the home but it's the neighbor and it's the community and it's the state and it's the city and it's the nation that we find ourselves either in harmony or disharmonious with according to Ephesians 6 1 and 2 in our moral purity the scripture warns us to flee youthful lust and to avoid them like the plague in 1 Thessalonians 4 4 and 1 Corinthians 6 18 and in genuine friendships one of the basic, basic human needs of all of us is to have friendship and that friendship must begin and end with God because as we find ourselves part of that friendship with God being called God's friend the nature of being a friend becomes imbued in us by the fact that we have a friendship with God and he changes us to become friends with each other by this shall they know that you are my disciples indeed and that you have love for one another and the only way that we can have that love for one another is by having that love first with God and being loved. So the reality of our studies has taken us through tracing problems to the root causes, to knowing those areas of conflict that we run into, to applying the principles of scripture to our life, and now we're building maturity through those principles. In other words, 
these principles, these four steps that we're going to look at today are four steps to maturity. And we're going to talk about some of the related scriptures, but we're just going to kind of go as an overview to them because we don't really present the book and then tell you to, you know, follow along or give you the pass out materials, you know, and then have you scribe the notes down. But rather, you can do that if you have the book because I found these, this book personally. I went out and I, I think I bought it for, I don't know, 69 cents, maybe 99 cents, you know. They're, it's by Bill Gothard, by the way. But those Principles of Life seminars were so wonderfully designed and coordinated that should they have been used in our society in more of a maturation development process where we would be teaching adult Sunday school to each other, learning how to deal with relationships, I feel personally that we wouldn't have so many divisions and strife and anger without being able to release each other to say, yeah, if you don't like it, go be blessed where God takes you and rest in His grace and mercy so that He can lead you to the place where you'll be one with those that you have fellowship with. And while you're away, I still pray for you every day because friends are friends forever. As the song says that Michael W. Smith wrote, if the Lord's the Lord of them. And that's what we're learning in our maturation as men and men and women as women instead of being boys and toys and you know, involving ourselves in just one aspect of ministry without putting principles of life into practice in our day-to-day -day living with each other. Because after all, not everyone walks around, to put it bluntly, like me, talking about Jesus all the time. But really, we must learn how to deal with the world we live in and the life we've chosen as well as make living the word we have learned not just on Sunday but all through the week. So in beginning this building maturity through principles we do pray and ask that Father by your spirit would you give us the wisdom to know what it is you would have us to grow in. Father, would you give us your heart that we might feel the tenderness of being led by your spirit, that you would cause us to be receptive to those things that you want us to know and you want us to develop into. God, give us the insight to be willing to be truthful in all that we do and say, especially in looking at ourselves in light of the words we pray. And dear God, we do ask that you would walk in the midst of us. For Jesus, without you, we could do nothing. And so with your help, by the Spirit you've given us and the Comforter that he has said he would be here, we do pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that you would be manifested in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. And so for me, I could not do this except that God be with me. I could not see and speak to you of these things, of principles of life, if it were not the author of life giving me those words that are life. And that's what this is all about. Life and life more abundantly. To live it fully to the greatest extent of the cup that you are filled with joy, filled with peace filled with the capability that in every circumstance and situation you're able to take a principle of life and make it living and alive for you that you would not be in conflict but cooperation with the ministration of the Holy Spirit as he moves you through this life we're living until he brings you home in glory to be with the Father in heaven. In Four Steps to Maturity the first one is principles of life as we mentioned. It is the scriptures. After all, underlying all the basic teachings of Jesus, there are significant principles which are essential for successful living. Just as most coaches will tell you there are certain principles or certain rules or certain ideas or certain ways that work, so too in life there are certain things that will work for you. You don't argue with the boss. <laughs> Just kidding. Cause that's a joke, but in reality that's part of it. But you see, in those principles of life, our foundation comes from the author of life. Our reality of our principle must be founded upon a scripture that gives life. And so we find the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's a principle of life. John 6.63 My son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. 
Proverbs 4, 20 and 22. According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us. 2 Peter 1, 3. So we find there are principles that are in the scripture, that are from the scripture, that going to the scripture brings to us life and life more abundantly, to a fullness that we could have should we apply those principles in our life. For some people, it could even be done without God. And they logically sometimes pursue that and they get philosophical. But the reality of how God works has always been to ask Him, to seek Him, to follow Him, to know Him. And in so doing, that's why our basis is not to work a principle, but to live the principles of life. You see, working one is doing without God. Living one is being in cooperation with the Spirit of God as He works in you. When you look at a principle, when you consider the words that are being spoken unto you, when you meditate on the facts that are being stated as you replay them on a video and maybe write them down or get a book and follow along, then it should be God and you working to develop those graces, those principles, those ways of applying to you that portion and par portion, that portion of scripture that fits in your life according to the way that God wants you to live it. Because the principles of life always apply, but how they apply is between you and God in the direct application of his ability to see where you are, how you are, and to take the word of God and make it alive unto you. These principles fit in everybody's life. How they apply them is always a learning curve. Sometimes some people are all into it. Sometimes people are taking bits and pieces at times. Sometimes they agree and sometimes they disagree. And that's how conflict is resolved. By appropriating the time, the place, and the energy to study, to apply, to pray, to learn, to consider, to meditate, to think on these things as the scripture reminds us to do. And that's what you must do according to all that's spoken to you. You must prove or approve that which fits for you. Wisdom is those principles of life and that's what you're learning. Principles of life are simply the application of knowledge to incur and become a part of wisdom. The whole book of Proverbs, part of Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, a lot of what Jesus said, these sayings of mine, and a lot of what Solomon said are the whole volume of what the Bible contains in wisdom. There are different aspects of the law that are contained that apply to wisdom. There are different aspects of what Paul stated in their application thereof that are considered wisdom. Wisdom is the direct knowledge put in through experience to the application of the person, the knowledge of the realization of how God applies word to experience to create knowledge that is applicable by living it, not just hearing it. So there's more to wisdom than just reading, thinking, there must be doing. Wisdom is that, as we've stated it in the steps of maturity, and we've discussed just now, number one, the principles of life. Number two, the relationships affected by principles. When a principle of life, as we said they are the response to God, acceptance of self, family, harmony, purpose for the future, effectiveness and friendships, harmony in dating and marriage, and management of financial affairs, those are things we've already gone over. But in each one of those, if we took them one by one, if there is a violation, if you have, as the old King Jameis saith, transgressed the principle of life, meaning you have violated your response to God, you've denied God a response when he has spoken to you, then that will affect your relationships in everything you do. It will create a conflict. So you must deal with your response to God. What has God said to you? And from that moment on, every relationship you have in business, in job, in life, in, in personal hygiene, in personal soulful experience and ability to relate to people in an emotional way will be affected. 
and everything that you think and take for granted, no matter what it is, you are unaware of all that there is in the spiritual realm that you cause to ripple effect like a pebble dropped into a pond when you are out of harmonious response to God, when you have violated or transgressed or caused a blockage between you and your response to God. How do you respond to God, what you respond to God, the way you respond to God, all will cause a certain amount of ramifications or qualifications to that area of relationship that you have with all of creation. Sin was that consequence of direct response to God in disobedience. Rebellion was incurred by the fact that Adam and Eve both were not just deceived, but they chose to not respond to God in a correct way. When our response to God, we choose to not respond in a correct way, then we cause consequences that we don't know until we deal with God personally again. And we uncover and discover what He is causing by way of our personal choice to not do as he said to do those areas where we should have been responsive to God and we weren't. Acceptance of self. Hey, when you can't accept what God has to say about you, how can you accept yourself? We discover that not only in the acceptance of self, but in all areas of our life, our self-image will affect our perspective of the way we look at each other and the way we have others look at ourselves. When our self-image is poor, we assume and presume much about the way people communicate to us and it affects our relationship. We sometimes, if, we're, if we don't have a correct acceptance of self, we cause ourselves to hear what we want to hear, to see what we want to see, to assume that someone is doing something to us because of a poor self-esteem. When in reality, the person is just as surprised when you state to them that, you know, I thought you meant this. And the person looks at you like, now why would you think that? I love you. You see, when a person can't deal factually, when a person can't deal actually, they can't deal factually. In other words, if someone says, hey, I love you, and they've not given any reason to not be trustworthy in their statement, then it should be factual that that person loves you, the same way that God has stated that he loves. He is love. Now, the reality of the factual demonstration of that is through Jesus Christ dying on the cross because God gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believes in should not perish by everlasting God. So we have a demonstration of it, but the fact of it was still done so by God stating it. So, in our acceptance of self, we have to first realize that if we do have an image of ourself that is incorrect, then we've got to put it back into our response to God first and see what He says about our acceptance of self. How does He see us and do we accept what He has to say about us is our proper response to self. doesn't matter what you think of yourself. It matters what God thinks of you. And if he died for you, that's the proper acceptance of self. In family harmony, if we have that disharmonious relationships that are extended within the family, they will manipulate themselves into every area of our life. They will vent themselves in some way by carrying, we used to say, baggage and luggage around until you find somebody that's actually good at carrying luggage and baggage. We shouldn't be doing that. Jesus himself warned us what would happen if there was division. There would be mother against brother and father against son and they would be at strife and conflict if they were not in cooperation and communication in the same venue of the same faith gender based idea of what we say God is. Somebody can come up to me and say, hey, you know what? I think God is Mother Earth. And I'd say, well, that's nice. Go play with Mother Earth. You know, and those people that deal with Mother Earth are Wiccan. Or Father God, you know, the great man upstairs, you know, wants to do this, you know, and you go, well, that's nice. That's Father God, you know, and go deal with him as a father. But the reality of God complete is the creator of the universe. 
is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, is our tender daddy, is also our holy God. So the complete picture of the family unit manifests itself in the reality of the Godhead in the Father, Son, and Spirit without there being this idea that it's male, female, you know, greater, lesser, you know, husbands or wives or children or, you know, dealing with some kind of irresponsible behavioral patterns that we picked up by trying to dominate or be subservient to or create some type of different environment than what God has ordained the family to be. And we know that we have fathers, just like God in heaven is our father. We have mothers, as God has said that he has given a woman to a man as a help meet, to help meet the family needs, to put it bluntly, you know, spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever it may be. We find ourselves, if in conflict with our response to God, we don't acknowledge what God said about family, and then we create our own family unit, like gender-based family units, being that, you know, same-sex marriage or whatever it may be, multiple marriages or multiple wives or multiple husbands or try to create something that God did not intend from the beginning to be. So those relationships have to be founded upon the Word of God and God speaking. We could make a law and say, oh, every man that divorces a woman is no longer fit to be saved. They are condemned to hell and going to hell. And there have been Christian religions that have done that. The Baptists come close. I'm kidding. <laughs> don't go. Don't go there. But the Baptists, you know, they, they they say that you can't serve in ministry. You know, and you you know, if you get divorced, then forget it. Until you know, Charles Stanley messed that one up. You know, and they kind of like deal with special dispensations on some things. And you know, the Catholic Church, same thing. Is you can't get divorced unless accepted by the hierarchy. In some ways, those are good things. But you must understand your family harmony in order to deal with your worldly harmony to deal with your godly harmony because if you're in conflict in these areas they reveal themselves in another area and they usually boil down to the first area of our conflict the response to God have we dealt with God on our family relationships purpose for the future if we don't know where we're going why are we doing it again everything will go backwards from our purpose for the future to our family harmony to our acceptance of self to the response to God. If we are properly responding to God, then he's telling us what to do. He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. If we humble ourselves and pray, he would lead us. If we trust in the Lord with all our heart, leaning not in our own understanding and not always acknowledging him, he would direct our path. There's no reason not to know what God wants you to do and what your purpose is for the future. It is a symptom of a improper response to God. Not asking, you won't get the answer. You get the answer, then it's just a matter of obedience. Always backtracks. Our effectiveness in friendship is always relegated by our design of what God has intended for us to be because God in doing so gives us the ability to be what he intends us to be. He doesn't give you the ability to be something you're not. He gives you the ability to be something that you are and he wants you to become. He wants you to become likened unto his son which we already know as a Designed each and every one of us through different gifts and capabilities and abilities within the parameters of our learning curve. If every one of us woke up one day and looked like Jesus, acted like Jesus, and walked like Jesus, we wouldn't have a problem. But we aren't. So in so developing our effectiveness in friendships, we need to know what the design of friendship was for in order to fulfill the purpose of friendship. If two shall walk together and one stumble, then the other would lift them up. And a three-four, three-strand cord is not easily broken. So, there's a reason why we have friendships, and they must be effective, not just defective. And if there's conflict in our friendships, it's manifested to backwards by looking at 
either the purpose or the family or the acceptance of self or response to God. Our harmony in dating and marriage will always have from those relationships of friendship, purpose, family, acceptance, and response to God a obvious direct line consequence of whether or not you are able to be in harmony and dating according to what God has said or you're in conflict denying the way that God would have you to do to learn and develop in your relationships the step to the process of marriage to the step in the process of why and what God designed marriage to be in the first place because it is the natural order so to speak in the spirit of moving from effective friendship with another person of the opposite sex to the purpose that God designed that person to be which might be for you in order to become the fulfillment of what he wants in marriage and has designed it for and in the management of financial affairs it becomes obvious that to whom God has entrusted much is required and when God gives someone something then he wants you to be responsible for it so that there would be that process of reaping what you sow planting seeds for the effectiveness of not just the ministry but also of the ability to minister to other people because in marriage your capability of financial sovereignty so to speak or the management of your financial affairs will always be in direct proportion to your obedience to the Word of God and the response to God as he has chosen to lead you in that marriage so you see it all works together cooperatively and if there's conflict in those areas in your relationships affected by the principles in any one of those areas if those relationships are affected then your principles need to be re-examined of what you're doing why you're doing it and where you went wrong you step by step work them out and you really can't detail quite frankly if you could do it in your mind very quickly evaluate your error and correct it quickly as you have learned them through the portion of time that God gives you in order to apply wisdom as you go into conflict and you find yourself in a type of relationship that is in error of some way where you don't have peace you don't have love and you don't have joy directly is affected by those relationships because of a principle in them the ear that hear at the reproof of the Bible the scriptural basis for the relationships affected by principles that we've just detailed are the ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise Proverbs 15 31 he is in the way of life that keepeth instructions but he that refuses reproof reproof erreth Proverbs 10 17 for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and the reproofs of instruction are the ways of life Proverbs 6 23 conflict is reproving if you're in conflict it's because it's the direct result of a improper or a violation or a transgression of a principle of life it's a reproof God is causing the circumstances to dictate to you to do something about the situation that you find yourself in conflict with and the evaluation process is putting into practice the principles of life three in decision making we have the steps to correct the violation or the transgressions once a breakdown in a life relationship has been traced to a violation of a principle of life clear and logical steps of action are required to reconstruct the thinking and direction that we should go as opposed to the way we did go it will always boil down to evaluating cooperatively with God giving you insight pointedly directing you to that area of transgression that you have when your life relationship is affected in some area of the principles of life the decision-making process that you use is based upon these scriptures and the conflicts to the resolution thereof turn you at my reproof behold I will pour out my spirit upon you and I will make known my words unto you Proverbs 123 because of that we have no reason to not know or not ask James 1 5 I believe it is says if any man lack wisdom let him ask of God who abradeth not but giveth to all men liberally 
There's no reason not to know. And Proverbs 123, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 11, 28, 31. But let a man examine himself. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Though the principles seem intense, the content is simple. The declination or the delineation of each one of the principles and making them into format and structure when you're not used to logic or you may not be prepared for instruction or you've never been reproofed are challenging at best for any man, much less woman or person who doesn't realize that principles of life are for lifelong application, not an immediate resolution. You can't simply get what you want when you want it. In other words, the principles of life are things that are to be applied as you go through life, as you learn them, and as you apply them, and as you grow in the knowledge thereof of them. They will cause you to avoid the pitfalls, as it were, You'll be operating according to, according to a different legend on the map. You'll be seeing the shortest distance between two points. You'll be finding those places of rest and those places of contest where you're not striving against anyone, but you're seeking for mastery of yourself and your emotions. You'll find that you'll no longer be involved in those things that are not profitable to you but you'll always be seeking and finding those things that prosper you in ways you never imagined possible, even to relationships that will cause you to grow, not just spiritually, but financially, emotionally, physically, even spiritually, uh, spiritually even sexually or um, soulfully. So that you'll have greater depth to the person you are, as opposed to being a superficial or shallow person who automatically reacts. And whenever you drop a pebble in them, like if they were the pond, it would be like splashing all the water out of their cup. Wow, that's pretty shallow. So you see, instruction is based a lot upon correction. Whenever we have something to do to ourselves, about ourselves and for ourselves. That's called instruction and it's usually based on correction to readjust things in their proper order or to put them in proper perspective so we're heading in the right direction. When you're following a map you kind of you know begin to look at the landmarks and you say you know this said we should have got there by you know 2.3 miles and we're at 6.8 and I haven't seen any of these landmarks. Well you begin to realize I'm, I made a course incorrect direction. I've gone somewhere askew and gone off target rather than gone straight and true on target to the destination that I wanted to arrive in. And the principles of life always discuss about our direction being the necessary evaluation process of learning to take the time to reevaluate where we're going so that we know if we're going to arrive there or if we're just creating some kind of phony expectation and that's what's causing frustration in our life so that we affect all the relationships in a way that is not cooperative but conflict. And that's why it's the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts because we don't want to be in conflict. If anything, we want to grow and get past our issues that we have. We want to develop our principles of life. We want to expand our relationships in all of life and we want to grow through the instructions that are based on correction so that we are walking with God in every part of our life. Correction may produce an immediate solution but further guidance of discipline in scripture is essential to strengthen and reaffirm the importance of the steps which are taken. Scripture will always be our basic manifestation of God speaking directly to us. He may speak audibly at times, and he has with me. 
He may speak directly to you at times and reveal himself to you in a person as Jesus was revealed at times in the past and does today and will in the future. He may send an angel or a pastor or an elder or some instructor or teacher or somebody that shares and relates the word of God to you in a way that you understand that it's not the person speaking but the spirit of God using that to teach you something and it's applied to your life in a way that you understand and comprehend so that you can move forward. But there's always got to be that correction that's coming from the word of God to keep you true to the instructions that the Word of God are so that you know you're following the purpose of life that's designed for you in the Word of God as you are being made comparable or you are being made conformable to that Word that is living and alive in you to cause you to be in yourself a Word of God living as a testimony to the glory of God our Father in Jesus Christ being that Bible that you are. You are a Word of God as you are operating according to the original Word of God. You are a transliteration, so to speak, or a transmutation of the Word of God into, into visual, factual witness of the testimony of Jesus Christ as He's living in you and causing you to become the Word of God in this life kind of wild when you think about it in a way. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. These are the reasons why we take these four steps to maturity the principles of life, the relationships affected by principles, the steps to correct violations, and the instructions based on correction, and the related scriptures is because in that definitive process of knowing why we're doing something, we begin to comprehend when we have such a volume of knowledge and knowledge base to expand upon that we can cooperate with how God looks at us being so important that he would choose to not just lay out, oh, we're just going to name it, claim it. Oh, we're just going to operate by grace. Oh, we're just going to fumble and stumble until we can you know, jumble and bumble it all the way around the clock. No. You see, there are principles that take you as a ladder. Step by step, higher and higher. You don't have to have an inconsistent walk with God. You can have a consistent process of development as a mature man of God growing in your relationship with Him as well as everyone and everything around you if, and it's always the big if, if we choose to apply the Word of God, if we choose to listen to the Word of God, if we choose to make real the Word of God, if we choose to be the example of the Word of God, if we choose to be the person who is putting into practice principles that we live by, that we don't make them a law unto themselves that would strangle us or condemn us, but that they correct us and they cause us to look at what we're doing and just like a mean bubble when you're trying to level out a plane, you know how you have a bubble, you know, like when you're trying to make something level? You, you take a level and it's got, you know, liquid in there and a little air bubble inside. It's like that bubble just moves around until you get it just right. And if you've got two bubbles going two different directions, when you want the just mean, meaning like the perfect center of that horizontal, vertical center of being, that's what we call the center of God's will. Chuck Smith used to teach something and says, you, you know, you could be in God's will. And they used to argue, and he'd state something about perfect will and permissive will and whatever will and, you know, will and Mary and John and Dick and Harry. You know, I don't. But for me, it was like, God's scales are just balance. And so whenever I heard things that didn't seem to make sense, I would ask God what makes sense for me. So for a bubble to be perfect, perpendicular with God in correct relationship horizontal and I have correct relationships with my brothers and sisters vertical 
then I would have to have balance in that with the Word of God and the principles of life, making them applicable to me so that I'm having the right perspective of how God wants me to be in involving in loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving my neighbor as myself. Because that's your vertical and that's your horizontal. And that is a principle of life. Father, I thank you that you've given us not just your word, because the word's great. I mean, we love the Bible. We can memorize it. Matter of fact, Lord, so many people are able to memorize scripture to make it so real and so alive that we become experts at excusing ourselves with scripture, for scripture, by scripture, to scripture, and we rearrange scripture to get to the scripture of what we think the scripture is. And sometimes, Lord, we lose sight of the word of God because we're so busy doing the scripture then applying the principles that you have placed inside of them, like a jewel that's just waiting to be found inside that lump of coal, like that pearl of great price that you said that was in the field, that once they've found it, it's like, oh my gosh, I want to buy the whole field just so I can get that one pearl. Well, God, as your word has manifested itself in such a way that you are opening our eyes to see something unique and different in our way of evaluating ourselves and why we have problems in the world or with our neighbor or with our friend or with our pastor or with our deacon or with our wives or with our children then God even with men and men on each other telling each other the truth of scriptures it's not enough but when we see the principles of God applying them as you have said to do, then God, we seem to find the bubble. We find the, the mean, the center being of where we should be in balance in all the circumstances and things that come at us. For surely, O oh Lord, you've given us an example of the perfect person that was always centered on you, that always had his balance in proper perspective horizontally as well as vertically and that is Jesus. And so, Lord, I just pray that though we may never always live according to the principles and we may find ourselves in violation and conflict and if we learn these things, we learn how to make correction quickly and we are able to change that through the reproof and the instructions that were given from the Word of God, then, Lord, I, I pray that that understanding of that knowledge will be applied to people in wisdom so that they would know they don't have to go through the hard way of life and experience, but there is a way that is a principle and a development of no longer being in conflict with each other or with you or with the world or with those things that they do not need to be at, con at conflict with, but they can find themselves conformable to who you are. So Jesus, I pray that every person that has heard or seen or read or understand these principles, you would make them real in their life so that it would no longer be a principle of life, but that they would become the Word of God, living and alive, revealing Jesus as they are living today. Amen. God bless you. I hope that what you don't understand, you'll review according to your planning and your time of studying these things to show yourself approved unto God and not yourself or anyone else, but that you'll consider these things. You'll think about these things. You'll dwell on those scriptures and those principles that may help you in a way that you hadn't thought of before. And that should they give you insight, then you can take them to God and God can show you how to apply them in your life. Because as we go through this study, that never ends because it is a thick book <laughs> and there's a lot of pages to each principle, that as we study the principles of life and the conflicts that we go through and the maturation process that this study is of growing up men, growing up women, no longer being children, but rather being adults, then I ask that maybe you might take the time to consider inspiring others with who you are 
as much as Jesus inspired us with who he is. And the way you can do that is simply by being no longer in conflict with him at all, but rather brought into unity of the body of believers. God bless you. I hope you may find there's no reason to have conflict, but you can have comfort as the Holy Spirit leads you.